Book six, Canto nine of the Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Canto nine. Calidore hosts with Melaby and loves fair Pastorel. Coridan envies him, yet he for ill rewards him well. Now turn again my team, thou jolly swain, back to the furrow which I lately left. I lately left a furrow one or twain unploughed, the which my colder hath not cleft. Yet seemed the soil both fair and fruitful eft as I had passed, that were too great a shame that so rich fruit should be from us bereft. Besides the great dishonor and defame which should befall to Calidore's immortal name. Great travel hath the gentle Calidore, and toil endured, sith I left him last suing the blatant beast, which I forbore to finish then for other present haste. Full many paths and perils he hath passed through hills and dales, through forests and through plains, in that same quest which fortune on him cast, which he achieved to his own great gains, reaping eternal glory of his restless pains. So sharply he the monster did pursue, that day nor night he suffered him to rest, ne rested he himself but nature's due, for dread of danger not to be redressed, if he for sloth for slacked so famous quest. Him first from court he to the cities coursed, and from the cities to the towns impressed, and from the towns into the country forced, and from the country back to private farms he scorsed. From thence into the open fields he fled, whereas the herds were keeping of their neat, and shepherds singing to their flocks that fed, blaze of sweet love and youth's delightful heat. Him thither eke for all his fearful threat he followed fast, and chased him so nigh that to the folds where sheep at night do seat, and to the little cots where shepherds lie in winter's wrathful time, he forced him to fly. There on a day, as he pursued a chase, he chanced to spy a sort of shepherd grooms playing on pipes and caroling apace, the whiles their beasts there in the budded brooms beside them fed, and nipped the tender blooms. For other worldly wealth they cared not. To whom Sir Calidore, yet sweating, comes, and them to tell him courteously besought if such a beast they saw, which he had thither brought. They answered him that no such beast they saw, nor any wicked fiend that mote offend their happy flocks, nor danger to them draw. But if that such there were, as none they kenned, they prayed high God him far from them to send. Then one of them, him seeing so to sweat, after his rustic wise that well he weaned, offered him drink, to quench his thirsty heat, and if he hungry were, he offered eke to eat. The night was nothing nice, where was no need, and took their gentle offer. So adown they prayed him sit, and gave him for to feed such homely what as serves the simple clown, that doth despise the dainties of the town. Though having fed his fill, he there beside saw a fair damsel, which did wear a crown of sundry flowers with silken ribbons tied, and clad in home-made green that her own hands had dyed. Upon a little hillock she was placed, higher than all the rest, and round about environed with a girland goodly graced of lovely lasses, and them all without the lusty shepherd swains sate in a rout, the which did pipe and sing her praises due and oft rejoice, and oft for wonder shout, as if some miracle of heavenly hue were down to them descended in that earthly view. And soothly sure she was full fair of face, and perfectly well shaped in every limb, which she did more augment with modest grace and comely carriage of her countenance trim, that all the rest, like lesser lamps, did dim, who, her admiring as some heavenly white, did for their sovereign goddess her esteem, and caroling her name both day and night, the fairest Pastorella her by name did height. Nor was there heard, nor was there shepherd's swain, but did her honor, and eke many a one burnt in her love, and with sweet pleasing pain, full many a night for her did sigh and groan. But most of all the shepherd Coridon for her did languish, and his dear life spend. Yet neither she for him nor other one did care a whit ne any liking lend, though mean her lot, yet higher did her mind ascend. 
Her while Sir Calidor there viewed well and marked her rare demeanour, which him seemed so far the mean of shepherds to excel, as that he in his mind her worthy deemed to be a prince's paragon esteemed. He was unwares surprised in subtle bands of the blind boy, ne thence could be redeemed by any skill out of his cruel hands, caught like the bird which gazing still on others stands. So stood he still long gazing thereupon, ne any will had thence to move away, although his quest were far for him gone. But after he had fed, yet did he stay, and sate there still, until the flying day was far forth spent, discoursing diversely of sundry things as fell to work delay. And evermore his speech he did apply to the herds, but meant them to the damsel's fantasy. By this the moisty night approaching fast, her dewy humour gan on the earth to shed, that warned the shepherds to their homes to hast their tender flocks, now being fully fed, for fear of wetting them before their bed. Then came to them a good old aged sire, whose silver locks bedecked his beard and head, with shepherd's hook in hand and fit attire, that willed the damsel rise, the day did now expire. He was, to weet by common voice esteemed, the father of the fairest pastoral, and of herself in very deed so deemed, yet was not so, but as old stories tell, found her by fortune, which to him befell, in the open fields an infant left alone, and taking up brought home, and nursed well as his own child, for other he had none, that she in tract of time accounted was his own. She at his bidding meekly did arise, and straight into her little flock did fare, then all the rest about her rose likewise, and each his sundry sheep with several care gathered together, and them homeward bare, whilst every one with helping hands did strive amongst themselves, and did their labour share to help fair Pastorella home to drive her fleecy flock. But Coridan most help did give. But Melaby, so hight that good old man, now seeing Calidore left all alone, and night arrived hard at hand, began him to invite unto his simple home, which, though it were a cottage, clad with loam and all things therein mean, yet better so to lodge than in the salvage fields to roam. The knight full gladly soon agreed thereto, being his heart's own wish, and home with him did go. There he was welcomed of that honest sire, and of his aged beldame homely well, who him besought himself to disattire, and rest himself, till supper-time befell, by which home came the fairest pastoral after her flock she in the fold had tied, and supper ready dight, they to it fell with small ado, and nature satisfied, the which doth little crave, contented to abide. Though when they had their hunger slaked well, and the fair maid the table tain away, the gentle knight, as he that did excel in courtesy, and well could do and say, for so great kindness as he found that day, gan greatly thank his host and his good wife, and, drawing thence his speech another way, gan highly to commend the happy life which shepherds lead, without debate or bitter strife. How much, said he, more happy is the state in which ye father here do dwell at ease, leading a life so free and fortunate from all the tempests of these worldly seas which toss the rest in dangerous disease where wars and wrecks and wicked enmity do them afflict, which no man can appease. That, certes, I your happiness envy, and wish my lot were placed in such felicity. Surely, my son, then answered he again, if happy, then it is in this intent, that having small, yet do I not complain of want, ne wish for more it to augment, but do myself with that I have content. So taught of nature, which doth little need of foreign helps to life's due nourishment, the fields my food, my flock my raiment breed, no better do I wear, no better do I feed. Therefore I do not any one envy, nor am envied of any one therefore. They that have much fear much to lose thereby, and store of cares doth follow riches store. The little that I have grows daily more, without my care, but only to attend it. 
my lambs do every year increase their score and my flock's father daily doth amend it what have i but to praise the almighty that doth send it to them that list the world's gay shows i leave and to great ones such follies do forgive which oft through pride do their own peril weave and through ambition down themselves do drive to sad decay that might contented live me no such cares nor cumbrous thoughts offend no once my mind's unmoved quiet grieve but all the night in silver sleep i spend and all the day to what i list i do attend sometimes i hunt the fox devoured foe unto my lambs and him dislodge away sometime the fawn i practise from the doe or from the goat her kid how to convey another while i baits and nets display the birds to catch or fishes to beguile and when i weary am i down do lay my limbs in every shade to rest from toil and drink of every brook when thirst my throat doth boil the time was once in my first prime of years when pride of youth forth pricked my desire that i disdained amongst mine equal peers to follow sheep and shepherds base attire for further fortune then i would inquire and leaving home to royal court i sought where i did sell myself for yearly hire and in the prince's garden daily wrought there i beheld such vainness as i never thought with sight whereof soon cloyed and long deluded with idle hopes which them do entertain after i had ten years myself excluded from native home and spent my youth in vain i gan my follies to myself to plain and this sweet peace whose lack did then appear though back returning to my sheep again i from thenceforth have learned to love more dear this lowly quiet life which i inherit here whilst thus he talked the knight with greedy ear hung still upon his melting mouth a tent whose senseful words empierced his heart so near that he was wrapped with double ravishment both of his speech that wrought him great content and also of the object of his view on which his hungry eye was always bent that twixt his pleasing tongue and her fair hue he lost himself and like one half entranced grew yet to occasion means to work his mind and to insinuate his heart's desire he thus replied now surely sire i find that all this world's gay shows which we admire be but vain shadows to this safe retire of life which here in lowliness ye lead fearless of foes or fortune's rackful ire which tosseth states and under foot doth tread the mighty ones afraid of every change's dread that even i which daily do behold the glory of the great mongst whom i won and now have proved what happiness ye hold in this small plot of your dominion now loathe great lordship and ambition and wish the heaven so much had graced me as grant me live in like condition or that my fortunes might transposed be from pitch of higher place unto this low degree in vain said then old melaby do men the heavens of their fortunes fault accuse sith they know best what is the best for them for they to each such fortune do diffuse as they do know each can most aptly use for not that which men covet most is best nor that thing worst which men do most refuse but fittest is that all contented rest with that they hold each hath his fortune in his breast it is the mind that maketh good or ill that maketh wretch or happy rich or poor for some that hath abundance at his will hath not enough but wants in greatest store and other that hath little asks no more but in that little is both rich and wise for wisdom is most riches fools therefore they are which fortunes do by vows devise sith each unto himself his life may fortunize since then in each man's self said calidore it is to fashion his own life's estate give leave a while good father in this shore to rest my bark which hath been beaten late with storms of fortune and tempestuous fate in seas of trouble and of toilsome pain that whether quite from them for to retreat i shall resolve 
or back to turn again, I may here with yourself some small repose obtain. Not that the burden of so bold a guest shall chargeful be, or change to you at all, for your mean food shall be my daily feast, and this your cabin both my bower and hall. Besides, for recompense hereof I shall you well reward, and golden guerdon give, that may perhaps you better much withal, and in this quiet make you safer live. So forth he drew much gold, and toward him it drive. But the good man, not tempted with the offer of his rich mould, did thrust it far away, and thus bespake, Sir Knight, your bounteous proffer be far from me, to whom ye ill display that mucky mass, the cause of men's decay, that mote impair my peace with dangers dread. But if ye all gates covet to assay the simple sort of life that shepherds lead, be it your own, our rudeness to yourself a reed. So there that night Sir Calidore did dwell, and long time after, whilst him list remain, daily beholding the fair pastorel, and feeding on the bait of his own bane, during which time he did her entertain with all kind courtesies he could invent, and every day her company to gain, when to the field she went, he with her went, so for to quench his fire he did it more augment. But she that never had acquainted been with such quaint usage fit for queens and kings, nay ever had such knightly service seen, but being bred under base shepherd's wings, had ever learned to love the lowly things, did little wit regard his courteous guise, but cared more for Collins carolings than all that he could do or ever devise. His lays, his loves, his looks, she did them all despise which Calidore perceiving, thought it best to change the manner of his lofty look, and doffing his bright arms, himself addressed in shepherd's weed, and in his hand he took, instead of steelhead spear, a shepherd's hook, that who had seen him then would have bethought of Phrygian Paris by Plexippus Brook, when he the love of fair Enoni sought, what time the golden apple was unto him brought. So being clad, unto the fields he went with the fair pastorella every day, and kept her sheep with diligent attent, watching to drive the ravenous wolf away, the whilst at pleasure she mote sport and play, and every evening helping them to fold. And other whiles, for need, he did assay in his strong hand their rugged teats to hold, and out of them to press the milk. Love so much cold. Which, seeing Coridan, who her likewise long time had loved and hoped her love to gain, he much was troubled at that stranger's guise, and many jealous thoughts conceived in vain, that this, of all his labor and long pain, should reap the harvest, ere it ripened were. That made him scowl and pout, and oft complain of Pastorel to all the shepherds there, that she did love a stranger swain than him more dear. And ever, when he came in company where Calidore was present, he would lour and bite his lip, and even for jealousy was ready oft his own heart to devour, impatient of any paramour, who on the other side did seem so far from malicing or grudging his good hour, that all he could he graced him with her, that ever showed sign of rancor or of jar. And oft when Coridan unto her brought of little sparrows stolen from their nest, or wanton squirrels in the woods far sought, or other dainty thing for her addressed, he would commend his gift and make the best. Yet she no whit his presence did regard, ne him could find a fancy in her breast. This new-come shepherd had his market marred. Old love is little worth when new is more preferred. One day, when as the shepherd swains together were met to make their sports and merry glee, as they are wont in fair sunshiny weather, the whiles their flocks in shadow shrouded be, they fell to dance. Then did they all agree that Colin Clout should pipe as one most fit, and Calidore should lead the ring as he that most in Pastorella's grace did sit. Thereat frowned Coridan, and his lip closely bit. But Calidore, of courteous inclination,
took Corridan and set him in his place, that he should lead the dance, as was his fashion, for Corridan could dance and trimly trace, and when as Pastorella him to grace, her flowery garland took from her own head and placed on his, he did it soon displace, and did it put on Corridan's instead. Then Corridan walks frolic, that erst seemed dead. Another time, when as they did dispose to practice games and maesteries to try, they for their judge did Pastorella chose. A garland was the meed of victory. There Corridan, forth stepping openly, did challenge Calidore to wrestling game, for he, through long and perfect industry, therein well practised was, and in the same thought sure to avenge his grudge and work his foe great shame. But Calidore he greatly did mistake for he was strong and mightily stiff pight, that with one fall his neck he almost break, and had he not upon him fallen light, his dearest joint he sure had broken quite. Then was the oaken crown by Pastorel given to Calidore as his due right, but he, that did in courtesy excel, gave it to Corridan, and said he won it well. Thus did the gentle knight himself abear amongst that rustic rout in all his deeds that even they the which his rivals were could not malign him, but commend him needs. For courtesy amongst the rudest breeds good will and favor. So it surely wrought with this fair maid, and in her mind the seeds of perfect love did sow, that last forth brought the fruit of joy and bliss, though long time dearly bought. Thus Calidore continued there long time to win the love of the fair pastorel, which having got, he used without crime or blameful blot, but managed so well that he of all the rest which there did dwell was favoured, and to her grace commended. But what strange fortunes under him befell, ere he attained the point by him intended, shall more conveniently in other place be ended. End of Canto Nine. Recording by Thomas Copeland.